Welcome. I would like to take you on a journey through ancient Eleusis, a city that thrived in Greece from 2000 BC to almost 392 AD. I'm going to give you a little background information first, then walk you through the ancient city as if you were a visitor entering the front gates. Think of me as your private virtual tour guide. To give you a location visual, this is a map of Athens and Eleusis in Greece. Unlike today, Greece was not yet a country. Athens and Eleusis were separate areas ruled by separate governments. In fact, these two cities were often at war. Athens was ruled by state or emperors who wanted control of Eleusis, while Eleusis was governed by religion, priests, and a religious hierarchy. At the top of this pyramid was the hierophant and priestesses, and at the bottom of the pyramid were cleaning crews that took care of the city. Athens did not like how much power Eleusis held over the people. It started as a small family temple, but over a thousand years, it had thousands of visitors every year. Eventually, Athens and Eleusis did come to a compromise because Eleusis could no longer keep up with the building and maintenance requirements with so many visitors attending every year. Athens had those resources that they needed, so Eleusis agreed to act as an extended arm underneath Athens' rule as long as the priests retained full control of the actual festival. And in return, Athens provided construction growth and financial funding. Note on this map the blue highlighted path from Athens to the ocean and then the green path or sacred way from Athens to Eleusis. We're going to talk about these paths coming up. The Eleusian Mysteries was a semi-annual celebration that told the story of the goddess Demeter and her daughter Cori. The lesser mysteries took place in spring, while the greater mysteries were celebrated in the fall. It provided information about the afterlife that was so powerful it changed the way the initiates viewed their place in the world. Aristotle said that initiates were not going to learn anything at the celebration, but they were to suffer, to feel, to experience certain impressions and psychic moods. Unlike other religion ceremonies, where only the upper-class citizens were allowed to participate, the Eleusian Mysteries were available to all. Young, old, male, female, upper-class, slaves. Country lines became obsolete, and wars were even paused to allow people the chance to visit the city. The only requirements were that a person needed to speak the Greek language, had the money to pay the entrance fee, were willing to keep the goddesses secrets, and you could not have murdered anyone in your life. The initiated were sworn to secrecy on pain of death, which is why the mysteries were lost for so long, because there are no written records of the details. It is said that the goddess herself dished out punishments to those that did not keep her secrets. Remember that green path from Athens to Eleusis on the map? Initiates walked a pilgrimage along that green sacred way. This was a 19-kilometer journey between Athens and Eleusis that took most of the day. The priestesses of Eleusis would carry sacred items to Athens where a celebration took place. People packed clothes and gathered in large public spaces, celebrating. Sometimes they would travel along that blue route to the sea, where they would bathe their evils away. It was common for people to also bathe their pigs for sacrifices at the city. There was then a march along the sacred way, hundreds to thousands of people on their way to Eleusis. Take a good look at this map, because I'm going to bring it up a couple of times to help explain where we are traveling through the city. The green highlighted area is the courtyard. 
as visitors came upon Eleusis, they entered the public courtyard through two different archways, which were in yellow on opposite sides of that courtyard. This place was the main area for social gatherings. Thanks to Athena's gift in Athens, olive trees have spread throughout the city, and they are the main source of greenery. A beetle, known as the cicada, feeds off of the trees. They sound like crickets, and this high-pitched cricket sound would have echoed off of many of the structures in the Eleusian city. On the left of the courtyard, a monstrous fountain with gravity-fed jets provided a place for water gathering. The picture you see in the bottom right corner is a drawing of what this fountain looked like. The photo on the left shows the fountain today. You can see the circular impressions in the stone where the water fell for many years. The Greeks and Romans were famous for their water wrangling. Not only did they have fountains, but also gutters on the rooftops, cisterns for water storage, drains in building floors, lead and terracotta plumbing pipes ran throughout the city for bathing and bathroom needs. Located on the right side of the courtyard is a giant fire pit. This pit would have been a place for sacrifices to deities connected with the earth and the underworld. The notches you see on the top were used to support iron grills for meat cooking. Holes were cut into the side walls to allow airflow. Today, the stone still displays charring marks from many fires. When the Romans invaded, as they did most of Europe, Asia Minor, and Northern Africa, they did something unusual with Eleusis. Instead of destroying it and creating their own structures, they embraced Eleusis and adopted the Eleusian mysteries into their culture. They expanded the city with grand construction projects, and one of these projects was a temple for Artemis and Poseidon. It is located in the middle of the courtyard and had a sacrificial altar available in front. This shows what the temple would have looked like in its prime and how it looks today. Artemis, bringer of meat, and Poseidon, collector of fish, were important aspects of the culture as they provided food for the people. One Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, took a personal interest in the development of the city. The highlighted green area was the entrance to get past the military defense walls. This is the second entrance to the city that was built by the Romans. And that little highlighted yellow part next to it on the left was Demeter's well. This was not the original Greek entrance, but an expanded entrance for the growing numbers of visitors. The building was quite large and had several fire pits inside. Marcus had a statue of himself carved into the top of the entrance. You can see a picture of him there. He looked quite fierce and somewhat serious. Just to the left of the Roman entrance was a well. In the story of Demeter, it is said that she stopped at a well while searching for her daughter Cori. Here she sat and grieved. This is the second well used during the mysteries. The first well was the original and it was buried underneath Demeter's temple during an expansion. This second well was created in its place. It was known as the Well of the Fair Dances, or the Well of the Maidens, where maidens danced during the festival. Those notches on top were made by archaeologists. At one point, they had a grate over the top so that no one accidentally fell in. The inside of the well was empty. Archaeologists noticed how unusually clean it was and suspect that it was cleaned on a regular basis by those who upkept the city. Next, we're now going to step into the original Greek Eleusis. The highlighted green area was the original entrance into the city, while the darkest lines on the map being the original military walls. I want to note that this is where scientists start to speculate about the origin of the city. 
written records were not as thoroughly kept pre-Roman. Scientists are baffled by the original Eleusis architecture because it does not replicate building structures of that time period, including the architectural style happening in surrounding countries. Scientists cannot find where the Eleusis construction ideas originated from. The architecture style was the first of its kind. Stories passed down through generations tell us that the design plans for Eleusis came from Goddess herself. Here is a drawing of what the Eleusian entrance looked like in its glory days. Two fountains with two statues lining a long tunnel just wide enough for a wagon to slip through. The floor of the entrance has many grooves worn into it. Archaeologists first thought that the ruts were from wagon wheels, but as technology increased, they were able to figure out that the two carved ruts in the back were tracks for a large wooden door. These doors had wheels that wore a track into the floor. The other two straight tracks were chiseled into the floor on purpose. They captured water that collected behind the doors and rerouted the flow elsewhere. Notice the two statues lining the doorway? These statues are called caryatids. The right photo shows the head of one of the statues now sitting in the Eleusis Museum. There has been speculation on whether or not these women were designed to be Demeter or in honor of a high priestess. When Eleusis was eventually destroyed, these statues were thrown from the front porch into the gutter. Later, in the 1800s, an archaeologist named Clark visited the area and noticed that the local farmers worshipped a statue on the side of the road. They called it Saint Demetra. He states that the statue was covered in animal feces. The locals would pile fertilizer around the statue for blessings on the season's crops. The farmers believed that the statue was alive, and if anyone touched it, their arm would fall off. Archaeologist Clark fancied the statue and decided to take it. He brought the statue to his ship for loading, but mysteriously overnight, the statue had returned back to its original place. Confused, Clark took the statue again, dragging it to his ship. And again, overnight, St. Demetra had returned to the locals. Now I want to point out that this statue is not small. It's essentially a very large and heavy rock that would have taken dozens of men to move. But Clark was determined. A third time, he took the statue and he placed it on his ship and set sail. Guess what happened? The ship sank. On its way to England, the ship went down. Clark, being an archaeologist, valued artifacts. So the statue was rescued in a lifeboat before it was lost to sea. He eventually did get the statue to England in 1812, where it now sits in a museum in Cambridge. The other two photos you see here were decorations on the entrance. While walking through the tunneled gates, these were the stones that lined the inner tunnel, so you would see flowers and wheat decorations on each side of you when you entered Eleusis. Just inside the entrance, to the right, is where the underworld was represented. Hades and Persephone's temple sat just outside several caves, believed to be the entrance to the underworld. Inside one of these caves, archaeologists found a motif, or artwork, depicting Hades and Persephone dining together. Next to them, Demeter was being crowned. Scholars believe that this piece displayed Hades and Demeter reconciling after the abduction of Persephone. There is an underground cave to the right of the temple where vessels of Persephone could emerge as if they were returning from the underworld. One of the aspects of the festival was learning how to accept death and the afterlife. Consequently, Eleusis was a popular place for people to be buried. There were several ways that bodies were laid to rest. 
the most prominent figures of society were buried in sarcophaguses, like the picture on the right being the fanciest example. Another example of a more simple sarcophagus is the photo in the center. Still a box made out of stone, but no decorations on the outside. Some people were buried directly in the dirt, but the most common method was to be cremated and placed inside of a vase, like the picture on the left. This vase was found with a small boy buried inside. Archaeologists have found over 417 people buried underneath the Eleusis city, most of them being children. There were several designated cemeteries, but the oldest bodies were found underneath building floors and roads. When a new person passed away, older bones were brushed to the side of the hole and the new body was buried in the center of the grave. Sometimes, loved ones would bury small family gifts with the deceased, including tear pots, which were glass bottles that captured the tears of the loved ones. To this day, archaeologists agree that there are many more bodies still buried along the Sacred Way Road, inaccessible because modern-day cities have been built over the top of them. Walking past several administrative buildings, we finally reach the center of the city and the main attraction, Demeter's Temple, which has been highlighted in green. Just to show a scale comparison, the red portion inside the green was the original temple built in 1600 BC. Over a thousand years later, the temple went through several wars, fires, construction growths, to the final design built by the Romans. That yellow highlighted portion is the front porch of the temple. There are two important things to know about the development of Demeter's home. The first is the original well, colored blue, in the left picture. This well sat not far from the first temple, just outside the front door, in fact. As the temple grew to accommodate the growing popularity, each new construction growth buried the design previously, so that the final temple had hidden caverns underneath the floors and the front porch completely buried the original well. The second fact to know is the importance of the Anactoron. The Anactoron, colored in green, was Demeter's personal space. Think of it as her personal special room inside of a house. During the winter months, Demeter lives inside this room to grieve her lost daughter. No matter how many times the temple grew, there was always an Anactron room available for Demeter's use. The only person that was allowed inside this room was the Hierophant, who was the priest who oversaw the festival. They alone were allowed to visit Demeter in her personal space and store the sacred artifacts inside. This photo gives you an idea of how large the temple was. The people in this photo are sitting on marble seats that line the walls of the temple. This is where people watched the mysteries displayed in the center of the room. Before any new initiates were allowed inside the temple, they were required to remove their shoes, wash their feet in basins at the door, and remain barefoot throughout the mysteries. This illustration shows what the inside of the temple would have looked like. Massive pillars held up the ceiling, there were skylights that let in natural light, and many torches lined the walls. Here we see how the Anactoron would have looked inside the temple. Do you see to the left of the doorway, there's a chair or throne, if you will? This was the throne of the Hierophant and Demeter's priestesses. They would sit here guarding the Anactoron entrance, the artifacts inside, and viewed the Greater Mysteries presentations. This is a picture of the front porch of Demeter's temple. When I personally visited Eleusis, I mistakenly thought that this was the temple because it is quite large. I could fit my two-bedroom apartment onto this porch. 
At the end is a fully grown olive tree standing about 15 feet tall that was growing out of a crack in the porch. The greater mysteries in the fall were held inside the temple, away from public viewing, but the lesser mysteries were displayed on this front porch, where people could watch the activities from below. There are crevices in the floor indicating that there was once two altars stationed in the middle. Here are some decorations from the temple. On the left, a stone with two torches crossed. This symbol is found in several places throughout the city and represents Hecate and or Persephone's light. The photograph on the top right shows some of the older temple structures, now open caverns underneath the floor. The bottom right photo depicts the design of the walls inside Demeter's temple. This is a photo of the Ninion tablet the most important artifact found by archaeologists. This is the only known artifact that explains the activities of the mysteries. There are no other written or artistic explanations of what happened during the festivals. Even so, this tablet only explains the celebrations of the festival, like the fair maiden dances, and the lower half of the tablet showing scenes of the lesser mysteries. There is no mention of the activities during the Greater Mysteries. Here are a couple of art pieces available for viewing in museums. The top left photo is a pig, often given as a sacrifice to Demeter, as the pig's blood is said to wash away evil. The lower left photo shows a plaque of Demeter and Hecate conversing. The elegant statue in the middle is of Demeter and would have been a prominent large piece somewhere in the city. The photo on the right was not taken at Eleusis, but at the Temple of Apollo. I added it because it is definitely a statue of a sitting Demeter. Notice the wheat decorations on the side of the chair? There are other decorations throughout the city right into the structures that hint at the importance of Hermes, Hecate, Poseidon, Artemis, Hades, Persephone, and Demeter, such as wheat, poppy flowers, Ukrania, cross torches, pomegranate symbols, etc. It wasn't until the 1880s that archaeological societies started controlling excavations, before that time, many excavators were wealthy private owners who would hire crews to uncover artifacts. There were no regulations at this time, and many artifacts were taken or mysteriously disappeared. My personal belief is that many private families scattered throughout Europe, Asia Minor, and Africa are in possession of the Eleusian artifacts, including the sacred objects that were stored inside the Anactron. I'm going to run through some of the outer areas of the city real quick to show the grandeur of the place. The purple building was where the Hierophant and priestesses lived. It is extremely large for the average home size of the time period. Inside, archaeologists have found remnants of an altar for Zeus, who would have been very administratively helpful for the leaders of the city. The orange highlighted areas were administrative buildings. This is where business meetings and financial decisions took place. The red area are rising steps or seats with a viewing platform below. Whenever someone in the city misbehaved, they weren't taken to a jail cell. They received public punishments in front of these seats. One of the city's positions was known as the stone bearer. This person would throw stones at the criminal, either harming or killing the person, while an audience watched. Don't worry, Spring Mysteries does not replicate this part of the festival. The blue areas were homes, the upper blue being permanent homes for the people who lived in the city, and the lower blue areas were mostly bathhouses and hostels for the annual visitors. The light green highlight areas are cisterns and silos. For such a large city in a desert land, water and so food storage 
was important to sustain the inhabitants. Last but not least, the dark green area in the bottom left was built by the Romans. It's a sports field where horses and battle games took place. If you ever get a chance to visit Greece, I highly recommend visiting the Eleusis city. It is easily accessible by bus or taxi. Compared to other tourist sites, it's cheap to enter. You're allowed to stay as long as you want, and unlike other archaeological sites, you're allowed to walk almost anywhere without a tour guide. It's a perfect place to contemplate the ancient ways, to ask goddess about her mysteries, and to enjoy the city views.